Happy Super Bowl Sunday, Common Sense Academy friends, family, and fans. Uh, today I have a special upload for you. Last week I was a guest on the Cosmic Geppetto podcast, which is done by uh, an interesting gentleman named Brad. Uh, he reached out to me. He's a fan of Sovereign Citizen, so he had me on the show. We talked for about an hour about Sovereign Citizens, the ideology behind the movement, and a little bit about me. Um, he's a fan of the Common Sense Academy, so he reached out to me and, uh, you know, we did this interview. It was a whole lot of fun. It's about an hour long, okay? So this video is long. After this short clip, it's going to run, and that's all audio. So if you have some time, go ahead, put it on, sit back and relax, maybe listen to it in parts. Um, I think you'll find it interesting. I also linked to Brad's podcast, the Cosmic Geppetto podcast. Check it out. He covers a variety of topics, news, pop culture, movies, comic books. I love it because I'm into all sorts of stuff myself. Uh, so if you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Sharing is a great way to support the show for free. Also, sign up for my email list. There's a link below. You'll get a free PDF of the history and examination of the sovereign citizen movement. You can unsubscribe from the list at any time. Now, before we go ahead and watch this video, uh, let's do a same time sip because you all know when we sip together, it tastes better. One, two, three, cheers. <sighs> Absolutely delicious. Not a video. This is audio. Let's listen to this audio. Thank you. I have a confession to make. One of the ways I relax is I enjoy, and it probably says something about me that I don't want to delve too deep into, but I love watching like YouTube clips of sovereign citizens and it's a pretty insane little subgenre of internet where these people who think the laws don't apply to them and then they find out they are wrong as far as i'm concerned the best person to sort of parcel out the, the whole ideology and um someone whose youtube channel uh the uh, common sense academy which is an ex excellent youtube channel and i recommend everyone check it out uh joe pometto Joe, the lawyer. Joe, how you doing? I'm good, Brad. I'm good. I'm I'm happy to be here. Thank you for uh, having me on. I'm I'm excited to be on the show, and uh, we can talk about sovereign citizens all day. <laughs> you really can. It's <laughs> it's fascinating, and I, I'm so glad that I was um, I found Common Sense Academy because. I, 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 and I, as people do that, I, I got into like a, a YouTube, a YouTube spiral mm. and found a couple of these videos. And they're very interesting because a lot of it, it, so many of these videos, and they're often taken by the sovereign citizens themselves, right. where, you know, you know, they're pulled over and they don't feel they, they don't think they need to have a driver's license or registration or whatever. And it always, in, the videos always end up with them getting pulled out of the car and arrested while screaming that you don't have the right to do this. And it's it's very interesting, um, but it can also get depressing and, all, and there isn't a lot of context. And you're so good at providing the context and sort of uh, helping a layman like me. I, 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 I'm no lawyer. I, I've watched a lot, I watched LA Law when I was younger and I've read too many Grisham novels. Mm. But you do such a great job of like, hey, this is what they're trying to say, and this is where the failure is. And and that's yeah, that's exactly what I try to do, Brad. And give you a little background. So I started my channel, and I was just going to talk about regular legal topics, okay? And I was sort of all over the place, and I made a channel on sovereign citizen. I made one video on sovereign citizens, okay. And the reason I did, back, did that was I had some feedback from uh, some of my audience. They were like, Joe, what do you know about sovereign citizens? Da, 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 da. Um, here's the thing. I knew a little bit about them because I'd seen them live in court. Okay. So I get the feedback from my audience. I make that first video. It's about a 20 minute video. You can find it. You scroll back in my old videos. And my what I did was I laid out why the sovereign citizen argument doesn't work, okay? And I just got a ton of hits. I got like thousands of hits on that video right away. Um, I got a lot of feedback and comments. 
And I kept making more on Sovereign Citizens. And then, like you said, I kind of got sucked into the YouTube tunnel on the videos. All right. And what I saw was lacking was, like like you said, Brad, a lot of the videos are taken by the Sovereign citizen, Citizens themselves. And they're recording the interaction, sometimes in court, but usually with the police. And there is no context to it. Okay. And people comment and they say all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, here's the thing. I'm a lawyer. I'm in court every day. I deal with the police. I do criminal defense. So I sort of understood what some of what they were saying. And I could also point out why what they say, what they were saying was wrong. So that's why my channel went in that direction. And that's why I started to do what I do. You know, my videos now, I do some commentary. We watch the Sovereign Citizen video and then I break it down afterwards. I, I feel like I'm providing something because most of the Sovereign Citizen videos out there is just this the interaction, right? The straight video of what happened without a legal context. And I try to, you know, clarify it and I have fun and I inform people at the same time. Well, and yeah, in most of the videos, they're either, you know, like we said, by the sovereign citizens themselves, or they're people who, with commentary that is uh, mocking. Yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, these people are mockable, but you show sympathy and understanding, I feel, to these people. And you even say, it's like, hey, you're sometimes they're a little bit on the right path, or they're doing things that, like they're almost their own worst enemies a lot of the time, right? And uh, you uh, you seem to address these things dispassionately, where you know, not haha, look, this guy's going to get tased. Um, and don't get me wrong, I understand schnon fraud, and you know, these guys are such jerks that it can be satisfying to watch them get their comeuppance. Sure. When they you know basically get taken down by their own arrogance, sure. but. Sure. That's not what you're doing, and it makes me feel I can watch these videos and understand it. Sort of not feeling dirty. Sure. And sure. I, yeah. and and I try to do that. I, I'll admit sometimes I move a little. I sometimes I move into the mocking area, but I I I do try not to do that because, like you said, you know sometimes they some of the things they say actually do make sense. Right. And uh, and I understand where they're coming from. Look, I'm a criminal defense attorney. OK, I I respect the police. OK. And, and what they do. But 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 by no means do I believe that the police are always right. OK. Or that the courts are always right. That is that is that is completely wrong. OK. Everybody is wrong once in a while. So, for instance, you know, one of the favorite lines that the sovereign citizens have is I do not consent. Um, that's a smart thing to say, okay? Um, anybody who is basically, you know, being uh, interviewed by the police or if the police wanna, wanna search your vehicle or your house, it's, it's, it's smart legally to never consent to it. So when they say I don't consent, you know, I try to go on my videos and I say, look, he's right, he shouldn't consent. You know, they often push it too far and then it ends in a transaction that doesn't go well for them. Um, but yeah, I, I try to break it down. I say where the police acted wrong, where they acted right, and then also where the sovereign citizen acted wrong or right. Um, the other thing too is, you know, with all, I don't, you know, I, I don't know exactly what to call the sovereign citizen ideas. Okay. You could call them a conspiracy theory. Um, with any great conspiracy theory, there's always a shred of truth, okay? And so again, some of the things that they say or do or they based on are, are like logical concepts, but I can sort of deconstruct them. And so I do that, you know, a lot of people go down the tunnel like we did, and I think I bring something valuable to the conversation. So if you're... I'm going to have listeners to this episode who uh, they're expecting me to talk about, uh, I don't know, the, the new, the latest review, um, preview for the Black Widow movies. This is, uh, might be a new world for them. How would you ex 
explain, um, you know, sort of like the elevator pitch of what a sonor- the sovereign citizen movement, uh, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it, what, what it encapsulates? Sure. So, you know, in the United States, especially, I think we've always had sort of um, movements that center around anti-government, right? That the government, um, either, you know, the, you could say small government, but anti-government. Um, the sovereign citizen movement is said to have started in the 1970s when there were groups out in the Midwest, militia type groups that were tax protesters. And they started to argue saying, uh, you know, the United States has no legitimacy to tax the people. Um, over time, it sort of mo- morphed into a, a greater movement, okay? And I think it's, I honestly think it's bigger than ever. It may not be, I don't know. I don't have stats. But a lot of people are picking up on it um, through the internet. So what happens is these people find these ideas and it, it's sort of hard to pin down, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call it a conspiracy theory for ease. Um, the theory is that, there's a couple different reasons that they use. The theory is that the United States government is illegitimate. Okay. The constitution is illegitimate or it's been usurped by, by, uh, I don't know, dark powers. Okay. At some point in United States history and the sovereigns believe that they can either activate loopholes in the law in order to avoid the law being applied to them or if they use certain secret language, either written or spoken, okay, they can, they can therefore escape from the law. Um, and so, like, one thing they do is when they file court papers, okay, they'll say the, 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 the court is illegitimate, the court is a United States federal corporation. And if they put certain statements in all capital letters, it's supposed to, like, deactivate the power of the courts. Um, they think one, one of the theories, oh, sorry, rather, let me get this one in. One of the theories is they rely on this old Supreme Court case from like the 1800s, all right, where it gave people the right to travel on roads that were regularly traveled by horse and buggy, okay? They think that that still applies to them. They have a constitutional right to travel in their vehicles um, and not get pulled over by the police or police can't stop them or that they don't need a driver's license. So it's it's sort of a way for them to argue that the laws don't apply to them. Yeah, that, and that's one of the things, if you see any of these videos, they're all over YouTube. And one of the things is, is so often they are somebody getting pulled over and you, you hear it so often. It's, it's like hey, you're driving on a suspended license, like, well, I'm not driving, I'm traveling. And that seems right. to be one of the magic words that they love to throw out. Right, right, right. Exactly. Mm. And. What I find really funny is how shocked some of these people are in the videos when it doesn't work and they're they're get pulled out of the car, the car gets towed, they get arrested. And I wonder, Joe, do you think it's a case, and I have a theory and I want to see if it holds water with you. Mm -hmm. Part of it is they've been told by whoever that this will work and they just believe whoever they're told. And also, does it sometimes work not in that whoever pulls them over decides, oh, well, I have no authority over them. But they just realize the the officer who pulls them over is like, this is going to be way too much effort. I'm just going to tell them to have a nice day and go on with it and try to pretend this didn't happen. Uh, Absolutely, Brad. Absolutely. Um, And it was, if you, I just did a live stream the other day and a retired police chief who follows my channel called in and we had this same discussion because I asked him basically the question that you just asked me. And what he told me is he thinks that it's a strategy that they use to put a buffer uh, between them and the police. And it's also a delay tactic. And it, it, you're exactly right. Some, so, you know, it, and, and it creates a form of confirmation bias where these individuals will encounter the police. They will use the sovereign citizen language. They'll say, you don't have authority over me. Um, I do not consent. You're violating my constitutional rights. You're not a sovereign. Da, 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 da. The police may get frustrated and just give them a ticket and walk away. And they think it's a victory. Right. And then it confirms their belief that the language actually works when in reality, it was more that the officer just didn't want to deal with it. OK. Or, 
you know, whatever the officer did, he was going to do anyway. Like he was just going to give a warning. Excuse me. He was just going to give a warning anyway. But then it creates a bit of um, confirmation bias, right? Like, oh, wow, I used it and it worked. So then what you get is they, you know, sovereign citizens, they go and they have their own YouTube channels and they talk about instances where the language worked. And there's even these like fake sovereign citizen lawyers out there. You can watch a bunch of them on YouTube and they'll talk about how they went into court and like won their case. I'm willing to bet that they won their case or that their case was dismissed for an entirely different reason rather than, you know, them saying the magical wor words in the court, you know, accepting that they didn't have jurisdiction. It's more like they just got frustrated or there were valid legal reasons for them to win their case. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, on maybe on a deeper level, they're, they're, it, they're creating a buffer between them and the police or the courts, or it's also a delay tactic. I think especially when they get into courts and, you know, they'll stand up and they'll say, um, you know, that your court is a court of admiralty law. Uh, like Your court, uh, they, they talk about the flags and the symbols that are in the courthouse. And they say, those are, those are, um, those are symbols of admiralty law. This is an admiralty court and you don't have any jurisdiction over me because one of the conspiracy theories goes back to, uh, don't quote me exactly on this, something along the lines of, you know, the, the 14th, 15th, and 16th Amendment being passed and, and you know, basically uh, admiralty law taking over the federal courts. Okay, so they see them as illegitimate. It's, and don't quote me on that. But yeah, it's a delay tactic and a buffer, Brad. So it's, these videos can be fun. Uh, and uh, I'm not even specifically talking about you. your your videos are always great uh, because again um, you do such a great job of uh, going going into the actual explanation and everything like that and it, it, it's very entertaining uh, watching the actual videos posted by sovereign citizens or whoever they're yeah, it's entertaining because oh look at these guys they're going to basically gonna step over themselves and they're going to get themselves in trouble but there's a level of danger, both um, by uh, some, uh, I heard about the lean sovereign citizens can uh, file, uh, and also some of these people are legit, legitimately dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I sort of, if you watch my videos, you know, I think there's a couple different classifications. Um, you know, there are what I like, sometimes people will be on trial for very, very serious crimes facing a ridiculous amount of time. They're hopeless. So they get into the sovereign citizen ideology. They use it as a delay tactic in court. You know, they're trying to gain some sense of control back because they don't have any. And this ideology maybe gives them that sort of hope once they, they adopt it. But that's, but, you know, that's usually when they're in the court system, they're in jail. OK, um, then you have the people who I think look into it um, because they they've had their driver's license suspended and they're looking for a reason to drive. OK, um, there's individuals who just sort of dabble into it, anti-authority, et cetera, et cetera. That's probably the majority of the videos that we see. Um, but then there are hardcore believers um, and there are instances of people who have you know, truly adopted this ideal. They, it's more or less a religion or a cult. Um, I don't like to call it a cult because a cult, uh, it, a cult infers that there's some sort of central, um, leader, right. Or it's a tight knit, tight knit centralized group. That's not true at all. There are multiple different ideas that certain people adopt, right. Um, there's this whole group out of Philadelphia. It's called, you know, they're they're mostly African Americans. It's they're like Moorish sovereign citizens, right? And their conspiracy goes back to the fact that the United States made a pact with Morocco in the 1700s, and they believe that that treaty, it was an actual treaty, um, gave all African Americans in the United States special citizenship, and doesn't allow the United States government to have jurisdiction over them. 
right? So I wouldn't call it a cult, but it, these ideas, some individuals, you know, truly internalize them and believe it. And so their, their operating system on their brain is the police are evil. The police are operating as part of this illegitimate government that's trying to usurp my God-given natural light rights. And uh, yeah, it leads some of them to be violent. It, they can be dangerous for sure. Yeah, there's, um, I'm from uh, suburbs of Philly. Uh, you, you're Pittsburgh based. Am I, am I right on that? Yeah. yeah, I'm in Pittsburgh. Yep. So, um, and there's been, uh, th- there have been issues related to that for, for decades. Uh, I believe, stop me if I'm wrong, uh, did you have one of the videos where you even talked about, uh, or briefly it came up, uh, the, the, the move issue in Philly? Um, yeah, I talked about it because I, going down the rabbit hole, I learned about that. I had no idea that that had even occurred. Uh, to, to, to those um, not familiar, uh, move was um, a very, uh, it was a black liberation group. Uh, and they had very bad relationship with the the Baltimore, I mean the Philadelphia uh, police force. Uh, there ended up being a in 1985. There ended up being a shootout. Uh, they smoke bombed the building, which caught fire, and um, people in the building, uh, the members of the move organization, most of the people in the building died, and like a couple of city, blo- a couple of blocks, and rows and rows of houses got set fire, and they it, it was. A real tragedy. Uh, I was 11 years old when it happened, and it was very um, remember it very well when that happened. Um, and you know that that sort of dis- what happens is when there's distrust between a group and the government. Uh, th- that's very fertile breeding ground for this, and it's also when it can really turn, uh, especially ugly. And you're right; it's it's the difference between uh, some 22 year old uh, dimwit who sees a couple of YouTube videos. It's like, I'll try saying traveling instead of driving next time I get pulled over and maybe I'll get out of a ticket. And people who are really true believers and can be uh, very dangerous. Right, right. It's, uh, yeah, I, I went down, you know, the rabbit hole of these videos and I found that move um, organization, that, that incident. And it was like, the one video I saw, it goes, the time the Philadelphia police you know, bombed an African-American community, something along those lines. I was like, oh my God. And um, they, you know, they, I can't remember exactly that. Like you said, it was like a liberation organization. I don't know if they were tied to the Moorish or even the sovereign citizen movement, but a lot of these movements have a lot of similarities. Um, And excuse me, the, the police chief that I was talking about, he's from rural Ohio. And he was telling me that he would encounter, you know, sovereign citizens and then militia groups. And these militia groups, though, they may not be exactly on the same page as the sovereign citizens. It's they they share uh, anti-government ideals. Right. And I think Timothy McVeigh was tied to uh, the militia groups. And then there's been murders, killings of police officers by the sovereign citizens so it's it's that's why when i started out i said it's sort of like this anti-government vein that exists in this country and um you know i like you said brad i do i sympathize with them to a certain degree um because i i completely recognize that there is injustice in the american legal system okay Um, and that's part of maybe what goes through their heads, you know, they, oh, I'm not going to get a fair deal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the same time, you know, these ideas, people take them too far. Um, it can be dangerous. And and a lot of times what bothers me is they're shooting themselves in their own, in the own, their own foot. Um, especially when they get into court and they do this and they're denying their attorneys, and they're trying to do everything on their own. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to demystify it. I don't know, maybe de-radicalize some people and just inform, inform people at the same time. Well, one, one very good explanation I heard of it is um, when it comes to people who get, not wanting to get their cars registered, and your first thought is like, yeah, you know, 
you know, you know, live in Pennsylvania. I got to get my car inspected every year or and get the tags. And it's uh, last time I got my car inspected, it cost five hundred dollars. Uh, my car has quite a few miles on it, and you know it, that stinks. It's, it's certainly money you would definitely spend on something else. But uh, well, you got to spend it, and it's once a year, and the car is paid off, so no big deal. But then you realize, hey, if you're somebody who's working uh, minimum wage or near minimum wage and whatever your situation is, that could be, that's a lot of money. And you have people who are in desperate situations and they are going to look for desperate solutions. And that's how someone can sort of end up getting roped into this. Yes, absolutely. And it's so I'm a I'm a criminal defense attorney primarily. Um, I do do a lot of different areas of law in my own practice, um, and a lot of people who come to me it's with license issues, driving on a suspended license, or they get DUIs, and it's you know they say to me they say Joe you know I have a wife and two kids I have to drive to get to work I'm gonna lose my job. You know, and and it creates this downward spiral, like they lose their job, um, they can't pay their bills, they get further in debt. If they lose their job, they can't pay the fines associated with the DUI or the other crime. Um, and so a lot of them, they'll come to me and they'll tell me, they'll be like, look, I'm, I'm going to drive, even if my license is suspended. And I'm like, you know, that it's it's not my role to tell them what to do. I say, look, if you drive, this could happen, A, B, C, and D. I mean, really, I tell them not to do it, but they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, and some people get their license suspended for years because they keep getting busted over and over again. Uh, frankly, I think the whole legal regime sort of needs to change, the whole legal scheme with license suspensions, etc. cetera. Um, and then... You know, they go on YouTube and they see this right to travel stuff. And I, I don't know, it's almost like a way for them to justify driving in their mind when they don't have a license, when their license has been legally suspended. Um, I don't know, maybe the government is driving them down this rabbit hole of weirdness. So I was, uh, you know, l- looking for the, the, the famous cases. I think the one that people probably most know was uh, it was probably 10 years ago wesley snipes got thrown in jail because he was using sort of a sovereign citizen or sovereign citizen related thing to claim that he didn't have to pay taxes yes yes and again that's sort of um one of the the core that that was sort of the beginning of the movement um, you know, I was familiar with the Wesley Snipes case. I didn't know that he actually he used the sovereign citizen, or but I'm I see it now. I'm looking it up right now. Snipes responded to his indictment, declaring himself to be a non-resident alien of the United States. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and it happens. They, you know, again, a lot of homicides. So if you see some of the recent videos when people are just like facing overwhelming odds. Um, they'll be drawn to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, if, if you believe what the sovereign citizens say, then you can make an argument that you don't have to pay taxes because the United States government is illegitimate. Um, and again, it, it manifests itself out on the streets when people are interacting with the police or even government agencies, but also once you get into the courts. Um, and one of the things that concern, you know, the courts call it paper terrorism because some of them will file hundreds of documents. You know, the, the courts are pretty open. You can file almost anything in the courts. OK, the only barrier to stop people from filing things on their cases is there's filing fees. OK, but the courts in the United States are generally not going to stop you from making arguments or written arguments, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've seen some wild documents. Um, but they've started to clamp down on sort of this paper terrorism. Um, if you do it too much and too often and the courts start to warn you and you don't stop, um, you can get criminal charges for stuff like that. Well, one of of the things that actually sounds really, um, that that I've heard discussed, it really sounds very scary is, 
um, they'll find out, they'll get the name or, and or address of the judge on a case or the, uh, the officer that arrested them, and they'll start filing basically bogus lawsuits or bogus liens against their property or whatever, and uh, like claiming there's a lien of $3 billion against their home. And it sounds ridiculous and no one will take it seriously, but it takes a bit of effort to prove those liens are invalid. And you can have, you know, some poor officer who, you know, pulls somebody over doing their job. And next thing you know, they have, uh, you know, they're, they are dealing with all these, uh, you know, like, bogus liens against their home. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that stuff gets filed. It gets on the docket. It takes time and money and possibly even court appearances to get it wiped off, to get it cleared up. Um, yeah, it's wild. Um they cause a lot of headaches, a lot of, one, frankly, wasted taxpayer dollars in the court system with all the bogus stuff that they do. Um, and on sort of the flip side of that, I covered an article that I found in the newspaper because what I do as part of the show now is I search you know, local news agencies and see if sovereign citizens been mentioned, right? And I mean, there's there's no dearth of information. I mean, there's one or two news stories per week in this country. Anyway, uh, there was, uh, I think it was a, a father and a daughter um, who filed some sort of like fake tax returns, okay? And they had, or they had, they got like five to six million dollars from the IRS um, filing these fake sort of tax returns. And then when they got caught, they claimed that they were sovereign citizens and everything that they did was legal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's many sides to this coin. Um, and I, I think that's another element to it uh, that we didn't get into, but is the fraudulent side of it. Um, there's a lot of people out there that sell these handbooks. I mean, you can buy them on Amazon. Or they literally go around the country and do seminars and conferences and teach people the real common law. I did that with air quotes. It's another one of their things is they say there's the real common law that was usurped by a fake, the fake federal government, um, either with the implementation of the Constitution or the 14th Amendment after Reconstruction. Some of them even go into more modern times with the, the Great Depression. There's so many different theories out. Um, but, uh, yeah, the fraudulent side of it is, is a big deal too, because a lot of people are paying money for this. So there's someone out there selling this, teaching it, getting paid lots of money, and it just contributes to the dissemination of it. Well, one of the, um, uh, one of the cases, uh, from last year, there was a, a woman, uh, by the name of, uh, Sharon Tracy Gale Bay. Um, suburbs of Philly, and she was actually there was actually video of her get teaching one of these classes and getting arrested during the class. <laughs> I didn't see that one. Man. I should see that one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it. Of course, there she is. It's like you don't have the right to arrest me. It's like, and there they are arresting her. Right. Um, right. And she was also in the news because when the police, um, she's been arrested several times, and one time, uh. Because she was, she stopped paying on her home. She let the mortgage, uh, she was passed on the mortgage. The house got sold back to the bank. And then they were trying to get her and her partner out of the house. They ended up um, going into the house to get her out. There was no power or anything. So she had like generators hooked up to batteries in the house to make everything run. Uh, milk, car, milk jugs filled with gasoline to run it. And very dangerous. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's the thing. Again, it's it's all fun. And it's a lot of laughs, but it's these people can be dangerous. Either people who are aggressive towards the police or uh, the liens against house, or they're just people who are trying to completely circumvent society and they don't know what they're doing. And it you know that it's a house that could have very easily blown up. Yep. Yep. Um. Because they're shutting themselves off from society. So it's, again, the video of her teaching this class is like, hey, this is how you, 
you know, you don't, you're not subjected to American law and then, you know, getting arrested by American law. Eh, that's, that's some fun irony and you can watch it. And, but then there's the flip side of it. It's like, oh, but there's also a dangerous aspect to this. And it's, you, you see where people can, it can be very seductive, these ideas, but it's also really, uh, it can be really malignant. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do think that people like some people can see it as empowering. Some people see the financial benefits of it, maybe like this uh, Mrs. Bay woman. Um, And, you know, one of the funny things I pointed this out, too, is, well, these people who teach these sovereign citizen classes, they have no problem uh, discrediting the federal and state government, but they also have no problem accepting United States currency as a valid form of money and payments. Um, so I wish that the people who read this would see that contradiction, right? I mean, if you're going to, if your argument is that the government's law, the government is completely illegitimate, well, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think that should apply to the currency as well. And that can kind of tell you where some of these people are coming from, right? They're making, they're making money off. Um, the Bay, you know, with the house, the interesting thing, and now I remember that's how I got down that portal and learned about the move on incident with the police dropping the smoke bomb. Um, when they initially went to investigate the house, a group of her followers gathered outside. I think they issued a warrant or had made some sort of warning that they were going to come get her. And like 40 or 50 people gathered outside of the house for like a day or two um, in a show of force. And so the police, which I think was really smart of them, you know, they decided to de-escalate. They just didn't go and get her, right? They just let it go. Um, and, you know, the crowd lasted for like a day or two. Uh, and I don't know if they were in the house or whatnot. And then, you know, those people didn't stay for long, right? They went back their way and they thought, oh, maybe we scared off the police. And the police just waited a couple of weeks and then went in and got her uh, when the coast was clear. Um, and they had quoted in that article the move on incident because some people were like, oh, well, why did you not, you know, I guess raid with the SWAT team when there's 40 people there? It's like, well, we don't want to end have a lot of people end up dead. You know, our goal isn't to get into a firefight with everybody. It's we want to make the arrest and do it in the safest way possible. Um, and I did a video on that. And, you know, I get I get a whole wide range of comments. But some people are like, oh, I don't I don't think the police should have went in and got them. And I was like, no, I was like, I think the police did the right thing there. They de-escalated the situation um, and then went in when it was safe for everybody. Uh, so, yeah, there's certainly there's certainly real threat attached to this, Brad. and. Again, what worries me, I've said this over and over, is I think the internet disperses a lot of this information and the rise of social media. So I do see myself in a way, you know, I would hope that some people, you know, considering sovereign citizenship or our sovereign citizens would see my video and say, you know, look, there's attorneys out there, there's people out there recognize that there's injustice, but you don't have to turn to this ideology. This this ideology is is wrong. Um, it's only going to get worse for you. Um, but you know, there are ways to sort of, uh, stand up for yourself in the corrupt justice system, but this isn't, this isn't the way to go. So, so, okay. So going back to, um, how long have you been uh, doing common sense, uh, uh, Academy? Ah, uh, you know, that's a good question, Brett. I, I, I started in, I would say April. Um, April, I started it, and it was called the Joe Palmetto Law Show. And just a couple months ago, I changed it to Common Sense Academy. But I've been covering this stuff for yeah, about seven, eight months now. Well, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, again, uh, I, I really appreciate the way that you, again, you do it dispassionately. And you sort of point out the flaws as opposed to just mocking people. because. It, Hey, I'm all about making fun of crazy people uh, or people who were sort of so obviously and ignorantly, ignorantly going down the wrong path, but it doesn't help things. And you're able to provide entertainment um, and showing the fun stuff. And you also edit it down so it's more digestible and it's, uh, uh, it's 
not like a three hour slog to get through a court case, uh, you know, getting it, you know, getting the real digestible, entertaining part of it with a little bit of education. And I, and I really, I very much appreciate that. Uh, and I think you're doing like a really a good thing here, entertaining and also uh, educating. Um, how many, I'm sure you've heard from members of this, uh, the sovereign citizen movement uh, who are, dispute what you say. What have those interactions been like? Yeah, I get a lot. I get a lot of comments. Okay, and I know that they're sovereign citizens. Um, I've also there's a couple other people in you know my realm here uh, who I am in touch with, and uh, you know some of them have wanted to debate me. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of the Moorish guys um, have actually reached out to me and they wanted to debate me. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to engage with them personally. Um, just because most of them are harmless, but I'd rather not escalate everything. Okay. They're going to hear this come after me. Uh, but, um, no, but I've said this before on my, my own videos. I've said this many times because some of my followers want me to debate them and I would just rather not engage with them um, directly, uh, I just don't think it's that productive, frankly. Um, and it's, I don't know, that's just not my style. Um, but yeah, they leave, a, they leave a lot of comments and they, some of them try to reason with me. Um, some of them just call me names. Some of them say, you know, a lot of them just try to reason with me. They say, you're wrong. And they go into like their particular, uh, theory. Uh, and why that theory is right. And they'll send me to other YouTube channels and they'll say, well, why don't you watch this guy and come back? And sometimes I'll watch it and then I'll comment and I'll be like, they're wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of hate. I mean, pretty much every one of my videos, Brad, somebody's hating it. Okay. Somebody's posting a negative comment. And the majority of the time, those are the followers of the sovereign citizens. So they come after me a little bit. Like there's other people in my realm. There's a guy who does a show, Artrexis Lives, and he's debated a couple of the Moorish sovereign citizens. And it was it was very civil, um, you know, when he did it. Me and him did a show together where we talked about it because he's been, you know, he follows the community um, as well. Uh, so yeah, they don't, they don't like me overall, but I haven't had, I guess, that much hate but i've got a decent amount <laughs> well i'm sure it sounds like you get a lot of disagreement I, i'm sure it helps that you don't again you avoid really digging in and making fun of or mocking or belittling people you're just saying it's like oh no this is what the the, the weakness so when you go in from it from that place it sounds like for the most part they're trying to come back at you with the same way and make an argument about trying to prove you wrong as opposed to how ugly things can get, especially God forbid on the internet. Right. Right. No, I think that's true. And, you know, I never thought about it until you said it like that, Brad, but yeah, I mean, most of them, they try to, they try to come at me by, again, arguing with me logically. Um, and they're, they're usually like, they're not going to win. Uh, and that's not because I think I'm that smart or anything. It's just that my, like, a lot of them are just misinformed or they have alternate views of history. And if you're going to have an alternate view of history, then what are we going to do? Like, there's nowhere for us to go. You believe history went one way. I believe it went the other way. And the evidence says it went my way. Um, you know, there's not that much I can do, uh, you know, to argue with you. I engage with them a little bit. Um, but I do think that some of them probably come after me um, logically because they see that what I'm saying perhaps makes sense. And, you know, that just goes back to, I mean, again, I'm a criminal defense attorney. Um, I believe that the criminal justice system has all kinds of injustices. And I love helping people. And I help people who've been, who've been you know, accused of really heinous crimes. I mean, I'll fight the system all day long. But I think the best way to do it is, is within the system or using legal arguments that exist. Um, one of the things that they do too, I get this a lot, is you know, part of their theory is that all attorneys are uh, 
are loyal to the crown of England. Um, and they believe that attorneys basically take a secret oath that makes them loyal to the crown of England that more or less existed prior to the Revolutionary War. And so that's how they discredit attorneys. They say, oh, attorneys, um, da, 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 nothing that they say matters because they're biased, right? That's their argument. And um, again, I've seen them in court a couple of times and it sort of broke my, I don't want to say it broke my heart, but I was like, like I've seen judges put them in jail or they sit in jail longer because they deny an attorney and they get up there and they make these, these insane arguments. And then the court has to like figure out what to do with them. Um, they might give them a psychological evaluation because like you can't proceed forward with criminal cases unless you're deemed uh, mentally competent. And so if you go in there and you start talking this stuff, a judge might say, well, get me a mental health evaluation. And that means you sit in jail for two more weeks until you get the evaluation. OK, and I'm just like, dude, like, you know, I've talked to them and be like, look, man, let me help you. Let the public defender help you. They will get you out of here faster. Um, and some of them will take it, but a lot, a lot of them won't. So, Joe, um, before I let you go, uh, well, first of all, um, how long have you been practicing law? Uh, six years. Six years. Uh, yeah. uh, and is this something you've always wanted to do? Like, uh, growing up, you, you, you wanted to be a lawyer, or was it you want to be a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates until you realize how bad the Pirates are going to be for the next forever? <laughs> Yeah, maybe when I was real young. You're right about that, Brad. Um, but uh, you, so I didn't have a lot of direction when I was younger. Um, I went into the military when I was 19. I wasn't a very good kid in high school or a very good student. Um, so I went into the Air Force and, I, you know, it really it helped me turn my life around. Maybe I needed that structure and discipline. I wasn't ready to go to school, you know, college when I was 18. So after I got out of the military, I went to undergrad um, at Pitt, here in Pitt, did four years there, went to law school. Uh, my sister is, is an attorney. Um, she actually works in a different field now. She practiced like seven, eight years, um, and then she got into something else. Um, I'll, <laughs> out. So when I was young, when I was, say, 20, 21, 22, when I was in the military, I wanted to go into politics, Brad. And of course, the you know the the common route into politics, especially in this country, is oh, go and become a lawyer, right? And then you get into politics, right? Look at every look half the people in Congress are were lawyers, right? Uh, state legislatures, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of why I got into the law. I'll tell you, I don't really want to go into politics anymore, um, but I really like being a lawyer. Um, and I enjoy it maybe more than I thought I would. Um, I didn't l actually like it. And here's the funny part on top of that. And life's just a crazy journey. My first couple of years practicing, I didn't like it that much, but I worked for other people. Once I went on my own, I, I found, wow. And I don't make a ton of money. I make decent money. I mean, I'm not rich. Okay. But I do, I do. Okay. I mean, I have a house, a car, um, you know, once I went on my own and started doing criminal defense, taking cases and clients that I wanted, that I wanted to help, that I believed in, um, I really started to like it. So, you know, I'm in a good place right now. So I'm curious, uh, there's always a, a, there's been a law and order on for the last 40 years, one form or another. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, there's been Grisham novels and Scott Turow and legal thrillers on TV and in the movies. Um, so has there been a piece of pop culture in, 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 involved with the legal field that you really liked, you thought got it right? And is there one that made you crazy because of how poorly it presented your, your profession? Yeah, so here's... A some of it I have a hard time watching at all or digesting. Um, law and order is, it, it, at least like the courtroom scenes, like I like law and order. It's not that realistic. I don't, I don't, I don't love it. Okay. Um, 
Scott Turow is good. His books are good. Um, I think he was an attorney for a long time. Um, my favorite, and I honestly think that in a lot of ways, it's the most realistic. And a lot of people may look at me and say, what the heck, or laugh or whatnot. As, uh, were you a fan of Breaking Bad, Brad? Yeah, yes, 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 it was. Have you watched Better Call Saul? Uh, I've, I, I, uh, I've watched some. It's something that I'm definitely going to, um, it's on my list to really dive into, especially now I think they're coming up on their last season. Uh, but I, I have enjoyed it. There is a lot of cringe watching with Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, where sometimes it's hard to watch. Sure, sure. Here's what I'll tell you. I When I first watched Better Call Saul, I was like, this is going to be dumb. I watched Breaking Bad, and I was like, but there are some scenes in it that capture the practice of law better, the realistic practice of law than anything else I have ever seen. And I'll give you a couple instances. I think it's one of the first episodes um, where he does so better. So Saul is a public defender where he takes court appointed cases. So I do that. Like the court appoints me cases for people who are indigent, right? Who cannot pay um, their own way for a lawyer. So there's a constitutional right to an attorney in this country. So the court pays me. I have a private practice. I get a, one or two of those cases per month, okay? Where they're paying me to represent a poor person. Um, and sometimes those cases are really, really rough, right? Like there's not much that you can do to win. And you're going to fight, fight, fight. Uh, and sometimes you find an angle, uh, but sometimes you're just going to get your butt kicked on the defense side, okay? As a defense attorney, you, you kind of have to sort of get used to losing to a certain degree. I shouldn't say that. Um, but it, it, that's the reality, okay? Um, in Better Call Saul, there's a scene where he does a trial, and basically they show the trial. And Saul gets up there and he makes this closing argument, this passionate closing argument, and it sounds really good. And he's like, my client didn't do this, and they don't have this evidence, da 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 and it, it sounds great, okay? And then the prosecutor gets up there and he plays a video of the defendant committing the crime, which blatantly shows that he did it, okay? And that's all the prosecutor does. It's his whole closing statement. He just plays the video and the jury comes back and says guilty. Okay. I love, I love that scene because sometimes as defense attorneys, that's the situation we're in. Like all the odds are stacked against us, all of, all of it. And you still have to go in there and give a hundred percent and fight for your client. I've never seen another piece of pop culture depict it like that. Um, also in Better Call Saul, he's like a struggling attorney, right? Like his his brother is like this big time, uh, super brilliant guy who founded a firm, you know, this giant power firm. Okay. And Saul decides to become a lawyer like later in life. And his brother's kind of like putting him down and he gets out of law school and they won't hire him at the firm. And the brother makes like some other, the other partner tell him that he didn't want to hire him. So Saul goes and starts his own practice. And when he starts out, his first office is like this room in a nail salon, like this, uh, this nail salon run by like, you know, these Asian women. And he's got an office in the back. So he's like sneaking his clients in, you know, through this nail salon. And there's a lot of reality to that. Like I, when I first started out, I'm like sharing office space. Like I'm literally like in an office that another attorney uses for storage and I have a little desk in the corner. Um, and, you know, people think attorneys, oh, you know, they get out of law school and they're instantly making money. It's just, it's just not true. It's just totally not true. Um, some might, and at the top of the class, you go and work for a power firm, but man, building your practice from the ground up. So better call Saul the way it captured uh, him being a solo practitioner building his practice. He gets a big class action case, which helps him, you know, go big and he takes the money. Like that's all real. Like that's how, that's how it happens. So I really like that show. I think it's in, at least in that sense, in a way it's more realistic than most of them. Well, it's funny. You just remind me of talking about as a defense attorney, uh, sometimes you're just, you can come up with the best uh, heartfelt speech or whatever. Sometimes you're just not going to win. And I'm just thinking, it wasn't, oh, what was it, just a month or so ago? 
uh, the case in what was it Boston, uh, Bam Poonam, uh, Tashara, uh, the guy who killed the two doctors. Uh huh. And the, the the you can see his defense, his attorney, just trying to say it's like well, there's no real evidence. It's like there was so much evidence, but <laughs> right. <laughs> And also, the, the defendant was belligerent and threat. He threatened the prosecuting attorney in front of the jury. It's like it was. It, he had to be pulled out of the courtroom, and you know, and this had to attorney's job to defend to defend his his client. And you know, he, he could have uh, he, he could have gone full Atticus Finch and uh, you know, to kill a mockingbird speech, and that would not have helped. Although it didn't help him to kill a mockingbird, but that's a different thing. Um, you know, it's, um, and that's sort of the importance of uh, a a defense attorney is like, everybody needs that. And I'm sure a lot of times it's not even getting that not guilty verdict per se, but trying to get, um, the, the right, if they're going to get convicted, make sure they're getting convicted of the right thing and lessening the charges or the plea deals and all those things. I'm sure that's all part of a fact, a factor of it. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, I can imagine you've, I, I'm sure you can't give a specific examples, but I'm sure there's been plenty of times when you've gone in knowing there was going to be a real long day in the court. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it happens all the time. Um, but it's, it, it, you know, when you fight those, like, I don't know how to say this, um, when you fight those cases where there's maybe overwhelming odds against you, number one, sometimes you do win. You know, most of the time you're not. Sometimes you do win. And then that sort of trial by fire makes you that much stronger when you get a case where the prosecution's case is actually weak. And then you can jump all over them. And uh, it's, you know, that's that's a great feeling to me um, because, again, most of the time we lose. I mean, most of the, most of the time if we know we're going to lose, I'm going to get my client to take the plea, right? Um, But sometimes with these indigent clients and they have really bad criminal records, a plea doesn't make sense for them, even if they know they're going to lose. So you take your shot, you take your shot at trial uh, and sometimes surprising things, the way things break down, um, there can be legal errors, et cetera, that can help you win. Um, you know, a lot of people may not like that kind of stuff, but, you know, my job is to, ze- you know, my job as the law is written is to zealously advocate for my client, no matter what they've done. Right. I mean, I have ethics that I have to follow. Obviously, I can't lie. I can't I can't knowingly present a liar to the court as a witness. That's actually a role that defense attorneys have. And it's, um, you know, if, if, a, if, if, a, if a client's going to lie or a witness is going to lie. Um, without us knowing, then we're allowed to put them up there and then, you know, things will be what they're going to be. But I can never, I can't tell my clients to lie. You know, people think defense attorneys are scum, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of differing opinions out there. Uh, But we actually have very strict ethics that we follow in the courts for the purpose of the system. They want us to advocate as strong as we possibly can, even in, even in a losing battle. I, you know, you bring up Atticus Finch and that he's, he's usually like the idol of most defense attorneys, right? Like criminal defense attorneys, Atticus Finch is like, he's, you know, he's the big guy. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I think is really terrible. Um, Gosh, a lot of it I can't watch. Some of my friends told me to watch Suits and I just couldn't watch that show. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I would imagine the worst is when it's not a legal show and they try to do a courtroom thing. Um, like, uh, my wife, uh, or, or like, I remember my sister growing up was a big fan of, uh, like Beverly Hills 90210 where they had a courtroom case. Right. And it's like, oh God, nobody, you could tell nobody in that world had ever open cracked a, a law book and they're just sort of like winging it. Right, right. You know, or if it's a soap opera or, you know, whatever. There's probably nothing worse than a legal, than a courtroom case 
uh, written by someone who written by people who that's not really their expertise. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I was, well, it's funny when you were just telling me, you just reminded me of, is, um, something when you were saying how you can't encourage, you, you can't tell the clients to lie. I remember the movie, uh, reversal of fortune. Mm, I uh, um, yeah, and it was about the Sonny Von and Klaus Von Bülow case. And Ron Silver played Alan Dershowitz, who's been in the news lately because of the, the Trump impeachment. Yeah. And he actually, uh, Klaus von Bülow, who was accused of trying to murder his wife, uh, Sonny, uh, and he goes to Alan Dershowitz and he's like, goes to tell him what happened. And he's like, don't tell me, because if you tell me what happened, then I can't ask, then I, then that handcuffs me on what I can, what my defense can be, because then I would be, I can't put a defense, it would be a lie. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So that like that can be. Yeah. I mean, that's an exact scenario. Um, Once the attorney knows, you know, that there's maybe there's a lie, then we can't have that witness testify knowingly. Um, There is a weird sort of um, loophole to that is. If an, if a if a witness or a client a defendant insists on lying, the attorney is allowed to put so the attorney can still represent them, but they would have to put them on the stand, and then the witness would do what's called narrative testimony, where the attorney does not ask; it's not question and answer like most testimony on the stand. It's called a direct examination. So if you have a liar and you know it, you can put them up there. And they can testify in narrative. Um, the problem with that is that that would tip off, at the very least, the judge and the prosecutor are going to be tipped off that this individual is lying, at least about one fact, okay, because the attorney's not doing a direct exam. Um, hopefully, the jury wouldn't know that or be tipped off to that. They might just think it's strange that this particular witness is, is you know, the attorney's not asking them questions. But that's kind of the loophole in the law. Again, it is weird. Um, what most attorneys will do, though, is have the discussion like occurred in that movie is they'll say, like, sometimes I'll say that to my clients. If I get the feeling what's going on, I'll say, look, you can't tell me. I don't want to know. OK, and we don't necessarily need to know in order to defend the case. But once we do know certain things, once the lawyer does know certain things, certain ethical duties arise. Um, and it can get real murky. Like if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I have a murder weapon. Oh, I have, you know, the, you know, the knife that was used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's very specific process that, that attorneys have to follow at that point. Um, so criminal defense is, yeah, it's, it's got all kinds of crazy pitfalls that other areas of the law don't have, which makes it even crazier to choose to practice it. Um, but you know, if you know what you're doing, you can avoid them and, uh, you might lose some clients over it, but you got to do the right thing. At least that's how I see it. Well, Joe, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, please plug your pluggables. Where could people, uh, find out more about what you're doing? Yeah. So, um, I got two, I actually have two YouTube channels now. Number one, uh, Common Sense Academy uh, you can go ahead, if you go into the YouTube search bar, type in Common Sense Academy, Sovereign Citizen, my channel will come up. There's some other common sense titled stuff out there. Uh, my logo is yellow with black writing in it. Um, so look that up, or you can put in Common Sense Academy in my name. My name's Joe Pometto, and that will come up. But Common Sense Academy and Sovereign, if, frankly, I've gotten to the point where if you search Sovereign Citizen in YouTube, some of my stuff will come up as well. Um, I got a new channel, which is called Joe the Lawyer, where I just talk about legal topics because that other channel's really turned into a sovereign citizen dedicated channel and a couple other things. So if you look up Joe the Lawyer, uh, you'll find me as well. Um, you know, it's got my 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 beaming face in, in the thumbnail. Um, but Joe the Lawyer, or if you type in my name, Joe Pometto, P-O-M-E-T-T-O. You'll find me on YouTube. I'm also a practicing attorney in the Pittsburgh area, so you can just Google me. But look me up on YouTube, subscribe to my channel, give it a try. 
Um, if if you like it, you know, stick around, watch my stuff. If you don't, well, you're no worse for the wear. Um, Brad, I really thank you for having me on. Thanks for reaching out. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this cut. I'm going to put it on my YouTube channel. I'm also going to direct a lot of my viewers to you. If you're interested in the sovereign citizen stuff and you found me, they're probably going to be interested in your topics as well. So um, I just I can't thank you enough for having me. I really enjoyed the time. Well, thanks a lot, Joe. And uh, we want to have you back. I would love to come back. I would love to come back. I've been on a couple other people's shows. And uh, maybe maybe you and I can do a video. Uh, what do you think, Brad? Would you be up for doing a video? I can put you on my channel. Oh, I would love that. That'd be a lot of fun. Just give me a time and a place and I'll be there. Okay. We'll work it out in the future for sure.